doggies. Oh, uh, hello. <laughs> Welcome to my cold corner of Missouri. <laughs> I am freezing today and it's extra cold in here today, which I'll tell you about in a second. Um, I don't know if it's really freezing where you are, but right now it is really cold. It is very sunny, but it's very chilly. And I live in a 113 year old house that is, has all hardwood floors, no carpet or anything. And it's adorable and charming and cozy and lovely. I love my house, I really do, but it is drafty. <laughs> so it's quite chilly. A lot of the windows are the original windows, so they let in a little extra cold sometimes and having no carpets and stuff, it gets quite chilly in here. Now, what I told you I was gonna tell you about in a minute is I'm having all kinds of technical difficulties this morning. And so I have filmed this podcast a couple times already and I've already shot like, what seems like 1400 test videos, it was probably more like eight or nine, but um, a lot of test videos, more than I normally do, to just make sure I had lighting and angles and everything right. But the main thing was my lavalier mic that I normally clip onto my clothes and attach to my phone with a cord, just for whatever reason decided it was gonna go out today, which is crazy because I haven't had it for very long and I've only used it probably 10 times, maybe 12, 12 or 13 at the most. Um, and I just got it a couple months ago, so, I mean, it was cheap. It wasn't a fancy one by any means, but I expected it to last longer than this, so I'm pretty upset with it. I've tried changing clothes, changing the settings on my phone. I've tried changing everything around me and my environment that I can possibly think to change, and it just will not behave. So I apologize if the sound quality is a little less than stellar today, but we are going to attempt it without a mic today because... I don't have anything else that'll work for that, and I really wanted to get this podcast out on time this week. So if I want to do that, I'm going to have to shoot today in order to make my schedule, because I have to dye yarn gloves later, and all these other things I have going on this week, plus my job at the salon, and yeah, I got a lot on my plate. So we're just going to go ahead and rough it this week with poor sound quality. I apologize, but like I say in every video, this is a journey, and I'm learning every step of the way, and you guys get to come along in the early days and learn with me. So... Rest assured, I will be researching better quality microphones on Amazon later today. And we'll be trying to order that for next week's show. Okay, so let's jump into our planned episode today. I am going to tackle sock yarns and sock knitting. I am so excited because I love knitting socks. I love sock yarn especially, <laughs> all the things you can do with it other than socks, but I, I really love socks. So we're going to talk about socks. Um... And I have a couple of things I want to talk about today, and then depending on how chatty I get about those subjects, we might break this up into two videos, or we might manage to squish it all into one. So let's just go ahead and jump right in. To start, I want to tell you guys about my very first sock I ever knit, and I'm sorry that I don't have it with me right now to show you. It's real ugly. Anyways, you wouldn't want to see it. Um, the very first socks that I knit, I got into knitting like it actually stuck, and I actually stuck with it about 12 years ago. I learned when I was a kid multiple times, never stuck with it, you know, learn, forget it all, learn, forget it all, etc. So it didn't stick with me till about 12 or 13 years ago. And um, after a couple years of knitting, I became obsessed and just wanted to conquer everything. I wanted to make sweaters, socks, literally everything. I wanted to learn every technique out there. I have not yet finished learning every technique out there, but I'm working on it. So my sister had taught herself to knit socks out of a book and she suggested tackling socks. And I was like, I have no desire to knit a sock, but sure, I want to prove that I can do it. And I know that serious knitters all tries knitting socks at least once. So I'm gonna give it a shot. So armed with the book that she used, I decided to sit down and teach myself and quickly got frustrated and told her, screw that. And so she was like, I'll teach you. Because I am not one of those people who is good at reading from a book and teaching myself. I'm much better at watching a video or um, seeing someone do it in person and then I can follow their, you know, I can watch them do it and then be like, oh, they use their left hand like this and they use their right hand like this. And so I'm much better watching. So um, once she sat down and showed me the book and then showed me what the book was saying, then it clicked. So I learned to knit socks and I actually did two at a time on two circular needles was the way that I learned. Um, and I think that was really smart of my sister to insist that I do it that way because she knew that this was gonna be a bit of a learning curve for me and it was gonna to be tough. And I also wasn't really thrilled about the end product. It was more the process at this point. So she wanted to make sure that when I got done, I had a pair done instead of just one so that I would actually finish it. Um, so I knit them and it took a while and they weren't very pretty. 
And I was excited that I'd learned it and I felt really accomplished and really proud of myself, but I didn't love it. So I was like, okay, great, awesome, cross that off my list, done, never doing another sock. It was maybe a year later that I was like, okay, I'm gonna try this again. So I got out the book that I'd bought at the time and I remembered enough with the pictures in the book to like try it again. My second pair went a little bit better, still didn't love it and was like, why do people get into this? I don't understand. And by that point, I'd become obsessed with sock yarn, but I also knew that you could do a million other things with it besides just socks. And so I would buy sock yarn and make shawlettes and sweaters and scarves and gloves, fingerless gloves and hats, all kinds of things. So I was like, yeah, socks are not my thing. So I don't remember what caused me to cast on that third pair, but it was a while later. And then finally I was like, I just, I'm just going to give it one more try. If I hate it, after the third time's the charm, but if it's not the charm, then I never have to do it again. But just one more time. I think it might have been my sister started giving everybody handmade socks for Christmas and the, she gave me like a couple pairs and they were so cozy and comfy and they looked so nice and hers were much better quality knitting than mine. So I was like, okay, I need to like be better. Maybe I just need to do a better job. And by that point, I knitted a whole lot of other things quite a bit better. So I realized I was like, okay, I'm improving in my skill. Maybe I could do it this time. So I tried again. And for whatever reason, that time it stuck and it was fun. It was exciting. I loved the socks that I knit. I don't remember which pair it was, so I don't have them with me to show you. But <laughs> most of my first pairs of socks have since worn out and been tossed or are just sitting somewhere in a drawer, not really being worn, just held on to for sentimental sake. But, um, yeah, for, from that moment on, I was obsessed. So I don't knit socks all the time like some people, but I do knit them pretty frequently. And shortly after getting obsessed on that third pair, I started knitting all these fancy pattern socks and vanilla socks were boring and I never wanted to do them again. And I've just recently rediscovered my love of vanilla socks for like crazy patterned yarns, for taking along in my purse to do knitting on the bus or waiting in lines or at the DMV or whatever. So I'm rediscovering a love of vanilla socks. I also like to use them for trying out new heel and toe techniques and things like that um, because they're easy and it's not so hard to work the patterning into a new technique that way. So I just wanted to share that story. If you have never knit socks before, maybe watch this one and see if it's something you might want to try and then, you know, give it a, at least a try or two. If you've knit them before and you weren't into them, maybe give them another try before you give up totally, but it is totally okay if you hate socks. If you never get into knitting socks, so gonna be okay. And you can still be an advanced knitter. You can still be an amazing craft fiber artist. You don't have to knit socks to be awesome. <laughs> so with that said, let's jump in and talk about the different types of socks. Like how can you knit socks? I had a couple ways that I wanted to go over today. Sorry, I'm checking out my notes because I usually don't make notes, I just talk. And this time I, I wanted to make sure I got in some certain information. So I'm checking out my notes to make sure we get it all in. Um, so I wanted to start with what are the different ways that you can knit socks? Um, you can knit socks on double pointed needles or DPNs. Now I have a personal confession. Um, I have never knit socks on DPNs in my life. Guess what? I've actually never knit anything on DPNs. I tried, I tried to knit socks and a hat on DPNs, and I hate double pointed needles. I never use them for anything. I only have two sets, um, and both sets have lost at least one needle. Um, there's a size three, and I think a size seven or something DPNs, and I basically just keep them around for eye cord and when I run out of a cable needle or when I need a stitch holder and I don't have one. Like, I literally just use them for like weird wonky tools like that. I never ever knit on double pointed needles and I will never because I hate them and I don't know why you would when we have the modern beautiful invention of circular needles. I am a die hard circular fan. I use circulars for straight knitting back and forth in rows. I use circulars um, with the, you know, as they're meant to be used with a cord and in a circle. But most of the time, the huge, I would say 95% of my circular knitting, I do on a circular needle using the magic loop method. Um, let me, I forgot to grab one of my sock projects. So let me grab that. Because I think I am using magic loop on the socks I'm working on right now. So let me see. Yes, I am. Perfect. Okay, so this is a pair of vanilla socks that I'm working on. I actually showed this a couple weeks ago in my second video. 
Um, I think I was actually on the other sock because I'd already turned the heel, so this is the second one of the set. But I am using the magic loop method. So with magic loop, if you're not familiar, you have a circular needle, and generally it's longer. So with socks, it needs to be at least 24 inches, and I prefer I have 32 to 40 inches. Although 40 starts to get a little crazy if you're doing just one sock at a time. Uh, but for two at a time socks, it's great, which we'll talk about in a minute. But um, basically, you take the circular needle and you cast on all of your stitches for the sock. So for this sock, I'm using 58 stitches on a size one needle because I have tiny little feet. And so you cast on 58 stitches. Then at about the midway point, you, um, so if I pulled this out, it would be straight across if I hadn't knit any, but there, there is a no break in that. So at about the midway point, you split the stitches and you grab that cable. Sorry, this is like all over the place. Grab that cable and you pull it so that now you have a front and a back side and you have a little loop out here, the magic loop, and then you have your needle points out here. And then the way that you do it is you knit across, you pull this needle, push these stitches towards the tip if you're ready to knit, and you pull this needle out and you start knitting here. So then you have a loop here and you have a loop here. And then you would knit across this whole thing. I'm gonna take that stitch out because I'm not gonna bore you by showing you my entire row, even though I'm a pretty fast knitter. We don't have time for that. But you would knit across this entire half. And then when you get them all to that, the other needle here, you would pull on that loop switch your sock and now it would be pointing the other way and you just knit back across. That's not the greatest way to do it, but if you have more questions, you can just search on YouTube for how to magic loop um, or magic loop knitting, how to getting started with magic loop, etc. And there's tons of videos out there. If you guys want me to make a video on magic loop, leave a comment below and let me know that that's something you're interested in and I'd be happy to make a demonstration video for you. But this is my focus is mostly going to be podcasting and talking about knitting and talking about things and just having a few technique videos here and there. However, my Knit Back Backwards video last week was such a hit with everybody that I am definitely open to doing more technique videos if you would like. So let's go ahead and talk about the rest of the ways we can knit socks. So we've got over double pointed needles, um, which I didn't really talk about because I hate them, but <laughs> please don't stone me, but I hate double pointed needles. Um, basically, if you're not familiar, double pointed needles are short, straight, uh, pointy needles and they have points on both ends. So there's a needle point this way and a needle point this way and it's just a stick in the middle. And they come in sets usually of four or five. And uh, for a sock, for instance, if you had like size one double pointed needles or size two, you would have um, your stitches cast on on either three or four needles. So you'd have like a needle here, a needle here, a needle here. And a needle here. So just like the magic loop, instead of dividing it in just two, you divide it into four. So if you had like, like 60 stitches for your sock, right? You'd put 15 stitches on each needle so that you had 60 total, but on four different needles, right? 15 goes, that's right, right? I'm not great at math. I'm pretty sure it's 15 times four is 60. Um, yes, it is. Okay, sorry. So you would divide it up that way. And then your fifth needle would be the one that you use as your working needle. So you'd start on needle one and you'd put your fifth needle in and work across there. Then you would turn it and then work across the next stitches. So you'd always have a free needle that would be your working needle. And then you would keep going around like that. Um, it is one of the oldest forms of knitting. Most people think that that's actually the way knitting needles started back in the day. And that's how they used to do circular knitting a really long time ago before they had um, circular needles. But now we have the modern magic of circular needles, which is like you saw a needle with two pointed ends and then a long flexible cable in the middle. And those cables can come in any size all the way down from like, I think nine inches is the smallest. There might be a smaller one than that, but nine inches for socks all the way up to, I think the longest one I've personally seen is 48 inches. Um, there's probably a longer one, but the longest one I own is 48 inches and it's kind of a beast. So I don't really like it. I don't use it very often. So, um, other ways you can knit socks. So that's basically the majority of people do them either on double pointed needles or circulars or circulars using the magic loop. 
Like I mentioned, when I started knitting socks, I learned to do it with two circular needles. So in that instance, what you would do is usually you would have a 24 inch needle and a 32 inch needle, say, like two different cable sizes so that you can tell which one is which, or you can use different colors or something like that. But you would have two circular needles um, and you would, you can do two nine inch ones if you're just doing one sock at a time. But just, it's exactly the same thing as the magic loop, only instead of being connected here, you would have one needle with the other point sticking out this end, one needle with the other point sticking out this end, and then you would knit across, you would leave it on the cable, knit across just like magic loop on this side, and then you would leave that needle, turn it, and then work across the other needle. I hope that makes sense. I don't have one going right now that I can show you what that looks like, but again, if you search on YouTube or Google two at a time, um, or not two at a time, excuse me, if you Google two circular needles sock knitting, you should be able to find um, some examples of that. Another great resource for that is the book that I learned to knit socks with, and that is Knitting More Circles Around Socks. And I can't pronounce this because it's um, slightly spelled differently, but I think it's Anki, An Anji or Anti, it's A-N-T-J-E Gillingham. And she's written a book called Knitting Circles Around Socks, and then this is the sequel, Knitting More Circles Around Socks. I highly recommend this book, even if you already know how to knit socks. She gives excellent photo tutorials. She talks about the parts of the sock and helps you identify like the gusset and the toe and all these different things, sock basics. And then she has a lot of pictures where she shows you exactly how to do her method, which is doing one sock at a time with two circular needles. Um, and then she also talks about, actually in this book, she's doing two at a time socks, but you can do the exact same thing with just one if you want. But this is great because it teaches you how to do two at a time using two circular needles so that you have no second sock syndrome at the end. And when you finish, you have a beautiful pair of socks. And then she has a few sock patterns in here as well, many of which I have knit and they're very well done. She's one of those who sometimes over explains a little bit. So if you've been knitting socks for a while, you might start reading her book or going through a pattern and be like, wow, I did not need you to tell me to do every single thing. It's kind of like, I don't need you to tell me to breathe in between my sentences. I know how to like survive. I'm an adult, right? It's kind of almost that basic at times, but that's why it's excellent for beginners. When I started, this book was invaluable and it was the only sock book I used for the first like two years of knitting socks um, because I was terrified to try any other way. <laughs> and she had such great explanations. And then I've kept it around because I frequently use this book for resources and go back and check things when I'm doing another pattern and there's a tricky bit in there or if I'm converting a sock pattern, like if there's a double pointed needle pattern and I don't use DPNs obviously. So if I'm wanting to do two at a time socks on circulars instead, I will often use this book to kind of help remind me how to set things up or how to divide stitch patterns, etc. So this is a great resource. I highly recommend this book. Um, go check it out. So next thing is let's talk about one versus two at a time socks. What's the difference? Why would you want to do it? And what do you choose? So you can basically either knit one sock at a time, which is what I'm doing right here, or, oh my goodness, I'm so not prepared. Hang on a sec. I have another one. I am also, I just cast on another pair of socks a couple nights ago um, because I'm testing a new base yarn for my shop and I wanted to try it out. And I apologize, my skeins got very, very, very ugly and snarly. So they're all kinds of tangled right now. But I am doing these socks two at a time on one circular needle using the magic loop method. So this is a size zero because I struggle to find sock patterns that are written small enough for my little feet. Like I said, I wear a size six in US shoes, which doesn't sound that small to me. Um, a lot of people think that's small, but I, that's pretty normal to me. I don't think that's very small. Um, but I have really narrow feet and I found in the past when I knit socks, if I knit for what should fit a size six foot or like if I measure how long my foot is, because most sock patterns are about the circumference of your leg and or the length of your foot. So if I measure my foot and leg circumference and go off of what it should be, I usually find that the pattern is too big. Um, we are going to talk about ease and fit and how to get a good fitting sock later on in this video or probably in a secondary video. But um, yeah, I really struggled. So I found that one way, if a pattern is really intricate and I can't just alter the numbers because it's got a very 
intricate chart like the one that I'm knitting right now has a really intense lace chart and I tried to figure out how to like cut it down like oh is it a multiple of four or eight that I can jigger the numbers and it was just hurting my brain to try and figure it out because it wasn't a small chart and it wasn't easy to fix so I just dropped my needle size down to a size zero lace weight needles I've knit several of my socks on a size zero and it's it usually turns out pretty good so I'm knitting two using the magic loop so you have this nice big loop out here and then um, it's great because you knit across side A of sock one. You keep going side A of sock two, which is actually flipped. There we go. And then you turn around and knit across side B of sock two and side B of sock one. So it's a longer trip to get around, but the benefits are at the end you have a full pair of socks. You don't have to go back and cast on another pair, which especially for intricate socks like this intricate lace that I'm doing right now, that is such a bonus because I don't know about you, but I enjoy intricate challenging patterns, but I am really bad about going back and not wanting to knit the same pattern twice. That's why it was such a huge deal that I knit the exploration station twice in a row because I never re-knit patterns or I shouldn't say never, but very seldom. Um, so it's a testament to the pattern if it, uh, if I will re-knit it. But um, since I don't like to re-knit things very often, I often do my socks two at a time. That's my preferred method. Um, but you can do just one. So I wanted to go over a couple of the pros and cons of doing one at a time versus two at a time. So with one of the, one at a time, the benefits are it's much smaller and easier to tuck inside your purse, which is why I keep a pair of vanilla socks that I do one at a time in my purse, in a tiny little project bag. I can slip it in my coat pocket if I have a big enough coat on. Um, I love that for portable travel knitting, especially if I'm in a tight space or I don't know if I'll get any knitting time and I might only have time for like half a row or something. It's great because I don't have to keep track of the pattern. It's very small and portable. So I love it for the portability and the space saving issues. I also like one at a time because sometimes it, if you're on a challenging pattern, it can be a little bit mind boggling to try and figure out how to do it on two socks. And sometimes it's almost like your brain hurts so much. It's nice to just focus on one and not have to think through the engineering of doing two. Because when you're working two at a time, like when you get to, um, this one is done from the cuff down. So this is the top of the sock and this is the opening for your leg. So when I get to splitting for the heel gussets, um, I have to work on just one sock at a time back and forth and do short rows and all that and you have to put the other sock on hold and you don't have to put it on holders you can move it to stitch holders if it really screws with your brain that's an easy way to get it out of the way just focus on one but usually I just leave one on the end of my circular needle and I just work back and forth and then go around but then when I go to pick up the gusset stitches on the side I have to go and work the second sock back and forth and things too before I can complete my round. So for some people that's just weird because it's like you're in the middle of a project and you got to like pause, go back here, redo your steps and then pick them up and somehow get them all working together again and it's a lot and especially if you're doing a really intricate pattern with a lot of stitches that flow down into the foot or down through the heel that can sometimes be too much to keep going. So one at a time socks is great for those more challenging patterns. It's also great when you want to test something out and see how it works out um, so that you can try it on one sock before you have to do it on another one. So there are some definite benefits. I'm sure there are more, but those are the ones that I'm thinking of off the top of my head. Remember, I'm extremely biased and prejudiced because I like two at a time better. Uh, so the cons of one at a time sock. Um, the bad thing about it is when you fit it, the biggest thing is when you finish one, it's such a great feeling to be done with the project, right? Don't you love that feeling when you cast off and you're like, I did it, I'm amazing, I'm so smart and accomplished and beautiful and wonderful and everyone should be impressed, right? And then if you're like me, you immediately want to put it on and wear it out and show everyone how awesome you are, which is also why I hate blocking. But um, the problem with one at a time socks is if you do that, then you only have one. So you can only wear one. So unless you are a one-footed person, which if you are, how lucky for you that you only have to knit one sock, awesome. But most of us have two feet, right? And so that's not gonna work so well for us. <laughs> so then you have to go back and redo it. And if you're like me and you don't like to re-knit patterns, sometimes that's a drag. And so it's really, it kind of takes away the emotional thrill of finishing up your sock. So there's that. Um, I'm trying to think of any of the other drawbacks. Oh. 
the other big reason that I do not like one at a time socks is I frequently either don't work from a pattern or I make adjustments to my pattern as I go to fit my specific foot better than the gen generic pattern or just, oh, I don't really like that. I'm going to change it. Or, oh, the pattern said to pick up 15 gusset stitches and my foot's a little smaller and my gauge is a little different. So I only picked up 13. So if I do one at a time, I have to keep copious notes uh, on the side and then I have to keep them with my project so when I go to do the second sock I can find them. I'm really bad about that. I'm constantly losing my notes or more likely than not, not taking complete notes in the first place, leaving sections out or being like, oh, I'll remember that or, oh, I'll just look back at the first sock and count the gusset stitches. I don't know about you, but when you're working on size zero needles, you go back to count your gusset stitches and you're like, oh my god, I can't see anything. It's quite difficult. So that doesn't always work so well. So for someone like me who's terrible at taking notes and keeping track of things, it's better if I just knit them at the same time. So then I'm like, okay, I just picked up 13 gusset stitches here. I'll do that right here, right now. And then I don't have to remember beyond a few minutes past, right? So that's the better deal for me. So that kind of already answers the question of the pros and cons of two at a time. Obviously the pros are you finish and you have the emotional thrill and high of you can immediately put on a pair of finished socks. They're completely finished and like we already mentioned on the con side for the one at a time, two at a time socks offer you the benefit of having identical socks much more easily because you don't have to keep copious notes and you are much more likely to knit them when they're done at the same time to knit them the same way. We've all heard that gauge swatches can lie, right? Because you could be knitting one day on your gauge swatch and your tension is really tight and then you're a little bit more chilled out and relaxed when you actually get to your sweater project and your gauge loosens up quite a bit or even within the same project. You knit the bottom of your sweater and it's real loose and flowy because you're all happy and it's the weekend and you're having fun and then you go back into work the next week and you deal with all kinds of stress from your boss, from your clients, from your coworkers, and it's just like, oh my gosh, I want to kill myself and then it snows and you're cold and you're cranky and you're tired and, uh, and it's Wednesday night and you're just trying to work on your damn sweater, pardon my language, and then you're just like going along and you get all tight and tense and then your sweater kind of comes in a little bit, right? We've all done it. We've all seen it or we've seen examples or heard stories of it happening. It happens with socks a lot and let me tell you as somebody who's turned out a sock that was way too big and baggy and I couldn't get it on my foot because it fell right off and the other pair was like so tight I could barely get my foot in there that literally happened to me one time and I had to frog the big loose one and redo it I think what ended up happening was I frogged it and then cried and then gave the yarn and the one sock away to a friend or the thrift store or something because I couldn't stand the emotional trauma isn't that terrible? <laughs> I believe knitting should be fun and freeing. So if I'm going to cry that hard about it, I probably should just give the yarn away and try something new. So anyways, there's a lot of benefits and um, there's also a lot of drawbacks to either method. So that gives you some uh, perspective on whether or not you want to try A, knitting socks in the first place, or B, if you want to do two at a time, one at a time, or if you want to do uh, double pointed needles, circular needles, magic loop, etc. We all know my preference is to do magic loop two at a time. Let's talk about one more way that we can decide to do our socks and then we're going to have to wrap it up for today because we're already running out of time. So this is definitely going to be a sock series. Yes, I'm happy about that because I wanted to do a whole series and then I was worried that I would have to squish it all into one video and that just wasn't exciting, but I should have known better. I can talk all day about knitting. so. We can definitely draw this out into a series. So the last way that I wanted to talk about um, choices on how you're going to knit your socks is one of the more obvious ones, which you guys probably already know. You can either knit your socks cuff down, which is what my two at a time ones are right now. So like I said, this is the opening for the leg at the top. And then I'll go down, split for the heel, pick up gusset stitches down to the toe. Or like my vanilla socks I'm working on, you can do toe up where you start casting on at the toe and then you increase for the foot. So you can see these, uh, if you can see that, these pretty sharp increases here on either side. Then you work your foot and I am just about to my heel. I think I need to do a couple more rows and then I will be at the heel. And then you work some sort of a heel depending on what type you're doing. That's for another video but we'll work different types of heels and then you go up the leg. So you have that heel part up the leg and then you bind off at the cuff. So you wanna make sure you have a really elastic stretchy cuff so that it can go around your leg. Um, so I do have the first one 
of these socks is already complete. This is my first vanilla sock, and these were knit from a sock blank, so they're, um, it's a single knit sock blank, so they're not going to be identical at all, um, which is part of the fun. They're just abstract and fun and crazy colors, and I love it. So this one, I started at the toe. This was the one I showed a couple weeks ago, and then I did the fish lips kiss heel here, and then I worked up, and then I did a nice stretchy elastic bind off so that it'll go around my leg. Um, so again, there's pros and cons to both ways. Most um, American, I heard somebody say recently that most American knitting patterns are, um, or up until the last five or 10 years have been cuffed down. And that recently it's starting to get a lot more popular to do toe up. I know that's how my personal evolution has gone. When I started, I only did uh, cuff down. Although in the book that I recommended earlier, um, she did demonstrate both styles. So this is another reason I love this book. I feel like I'm super promoting this. I promise I'm not getting paid for this or anything. I'm not getting anything as a bonus for promoting this. I just genuinely love it. But um, this is so great because not only does she teach you the two at a time method with the circular needles, but she also has patterns and photo tutorial instructions for both cuff down and toe up. So she gives you lots of great basics. She also has kid sizes available, you guys, and she shows you in the samples how to knit socks with like a heavier deep hair worsted weight instead of just fingering. I cannot tell you enough that this book is a must have for every knitter's shelf, especially if you haven't knit socks before or you're not very confident yet. But even if you are like a whiz and you are the best sock knitter in the whole wide world, if you do not have this book already, you are missing out and you need to go get it. Okay, promote promotional done. Um, so yeah, there's really benefits and pros and cons just like with anything to both. I recommend trying both of them and seeing if there's a reason that you like one or the other better but I don't think that there's a better way. There's just preferences. Uh, for me, if I am working either, if I'm making up my own pattern or just working a vanilla sock with no pattern, I always prefer to go toe up. And the reason for that is twofold. First of all, I can try them on as I go. If you start at the toe, it's real easy, even if you only have an inch and a half of fabric, to slip it on your toe and see, is it wide enough? Do I need to keep increasing? Or am I done? Should I leave it alone and just knit? The other reason is um, because it's much easier to just work with what you have as far as yarn. So if you're using up scraps of yarn to make a stripy sock or a faded sock, or if you aren't sure how much yardage is in your ball, or if you have kind of bigger feet or you're knitting a man's sock or, or knitting for someone with a really wide calf, it's a lot easier to do toe up because you can just knit till you run out of yarn. And then you know, okay, I'm done. Especially if you do two at a time socks. If you do toe up two at a time socks, you can literally just knit until you run out of yarn. You just have to split your yarn into two separate balls at the beginning. But as long as you do that, you can just knit until you, you are done or until it looks right to you. So you can keep trying it on and say, that's as high as I want it to go, now I'm gonna cast off. Or you can keep going until you just run out of yarn. So I love that. That's my preference. So um, if you write a knitting pattern for two at a time, toe up socks, I will probably be interested in it because that's my favorite method. However, I'm not super picky and as you can see, if a pattern is really intricate and has already been written for me, I am not gonna be super ambitious and go out and rewrite every pattern into a toe up pattern. Um, I've done it on a couple, but in general, I only do it with simple ones because intricate lace like this one that I'm doing here, I'm not trying to redo those charts. Um, there are a bunch of books out there and tutorials that teach you how to do that. And I'm going to go over some book reviews in another video in this series coming up where we will talk about some of my favorite sock knitting resource books besides the one I showed you. And I will show you a couple books that have specific techniques and articles about how to convert your patterns to either toe up or cuff down. So that way you can knit your preferred method even on a more intricate pattern. So I think we're going to go ahead and wrap up there for today. We ended up only getting to cover types of socks and how to choose to knit your socks, but hopefully that'll get you all excited to cast on, get you looking at patterns, giving you some ideas. Next week, we're going to talk about my favorite sock yarns. And we're going to talk about um, in the in the series, hopefully next week or maybe the week after that, we'll be talking about favorite sock yarns and uh, my books that I recommend, um, book reviews that I recommend. We're going to talk about a couple different um, types of fiber contents and things you want to look out for in socks. We'll talk about ease and fit. Lots of sock information coming. There's just two more things I want to say before I head out. 
The first one is, I meant to say this at the beginning, and then I was cold and excited to talk about socks and I forgot. But you probably noticed by now, but there's been a little change around the Miller household. This is super fresh, like I literally just bleached my head last night. Um, I've been blue. Um, I've only had three videos with my blue hair, but I've been blue and teal for almost a year. And before the blue and teal, I was doing the same dark blue at my roots for a shadow root, and then I had the ends when I first did them were kind of a denimy blue that then as I washed it would fade into silver. And so it was a really cool blue and gray combo. And I had that for a year or more. So I've been blue or teal or some variation of blue for the last two plus years, which for me is kind of a long time. Um, contrary to popular belief in my clientele and friends, I do not actually color my hair a different color every month. <laughs> it's actually been about two years. So I decided it was time for a change. I've been thinking about it for several months. Um, I had become obsessed with the blue. Blue is my safe and happy place. It's my comfort zone. It's the color I'm drawn to most often when I don't know what else to do with my personal hair. And I find myself drawn to purple and blue most often for clientele when I don't know what to do or they don't know what to do. And they're like, I have no clue. What do you, what do you suggest? I'm almost always like purple or blue or some combination. <laughs> so, um, it's my comfort space. So it's not surprising that I had it for so long and I just kind of felt like it was time for a change. So I'm not really going to say much more about that. I don't really have any deep-seated reasons why I changed it. Um, it's probably going to go through some various stages. Usually when I do a brand new color that I haven't done before, like this one is brand new, um, it doesn't stay in its original incarnation usually for more than one or two colors because I usually start changing it. It sometimes takes me a couple colors to get into the sweet spot of exactly what I want. So it wouldn't surprise me if this changes a little bit, but I think we're going to do some variation of orange and red for a little bit for now. Um, just try it. But yeah, a total, total change from like cool tones to the opposite end of the color wheel to super warm. <laughs> I usually don't do that. And I usually don't let my clients do that, but I don't know what came over me. Um, I don't know, but here I am. I feel very much like Anne Margaret in the sixties today because I've got my like leopard print pants going on and my super, super orange hair. <laughs> and I had some bright red, uh, bright pink lipstick on earlier. Um, I'm feeling a little Anne Margaret-ish today, which there's nothing wrong with that. So yes, I wanted to address the fact that yes, I do have different hair. Um, please be kind in your comments if you have anything to say. It will not hurt my feelings if you completely ignore the hair and just go straight to talking about socks. That's my whole goal for this video, but I felt a little weird not mentioning it. So um, the last thing I want to talk about is quick, quick little view of shop update this week. So um, this video is scheduled to launch on Friday. I might try to get it out Thursday night, but with all the technical difficulties I've had this week, I'll be shocked if I can even get it out Friday. But um, the goal is this weekend to coordinate with the release of my video, I'm going to have a shop update. And there's only going to be a few new things in the shop. A lot of it is just updating quantities, adding some things. I've been changing a lot of the photos in my shop. Um, stuff like that, but I do have some new stuff coming up that I wanted to share with you. The first one is um, I already had this colorway listed in the shop, but I added it on a sparkle base. This is Her Wicked Ways. Uh, this is my new favorite color. It is gray, black, magenta pink, and kind of a like purpley, I'm not sure how to say that exactly, like kind of orchid amethysty purple. So purple, pink, black, and gray, and it is to die for pretty. It is so gorgeous. I can't stand it. And I am going to have this in the shop update. I had it just on the Gaia Superwash Merino base, which was a, a fingering or sock weight. And now I'm going to have two more fingering weights in this colorway. Um, I'm adding the sparkle base. I'll have three of those out uh, with the Stellina sparkle. That's my personal favorite because it has that sparkle and those kind of gothy tones. And then I also have it on my fairy wing base, which is my Superwash Merino and silk base. And that is totally gorgeous as well. And then I have a couple oopsie skeins for the Mad Science Lab. If you guys are not familiar, Mad Science Lab is my area of the shop where I put oopsies, uh, one hit wonders, test yarns. The, um, when I get new yarns in to test out new base yarns, I put uh, base testing there or yarns that I'm discontinuing, sales. You can find all kinds of good deals and random awkward things there. Um, I have two skeins of this amazing rainbow. 
<laughs> this is called Through the Prism because it has this weird kind of rainbow. And this is literally the definition of a mad science game. I was just playing around and I had all of this dye stock left over from some other, um, from some sock blanks and other things I was painting. And I had just enough that I didn't want to just throw it away, but not enough that I really wanted to save it. So I decided to just dump it in a pot and see what happened. So I started playing around on these two skeins of Superwash Merino DK and Nylon. So uh, Merino and Nylon blend in the DK weight. And this is a yarn that I've had in the shop in the Mad Science Lab before a couple times, but it's not a normal base that I carry. There's nothing wrong with it. It's really nice and bouncy and springy. And with the nylon, it's really hard wearing and durable. It's just not something that I feel like I want to carry on a regular basis um, because I love my Temptress DK so much. It's so much softer and springier. But this is an okay one, and I had a couple skeins sitting around, so I used that for my prism yarn. So you can get, there's just two. They'll never be recreated because they were literally just using up uh, leftovers, and I blended a lot of leftovers, a little of this, a little of that, a little of this. <laughs> and then I was surprised that they came out so pretty. So you can get those in the shop on Friday as well. So either this week or next week, I will be adding my Valentine's colorway to the shop, and I love it, you guys. Da, 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 da. This is on the Foxy Sock, which is Superwash Merino and Nylon, perfect for sock knitting of any kind. And it's so pretty. I just, I knew when I was creating it, it was either going to be so pretty or it was going to be awful, and I wasn't sure. And it's so pretty. So, I will be adding this colorway to the shop coming up soon. And here's the really exciting thing. This is the thing I couldn't wait to show you. This one's definitely going in the shop this week. So you'll definitely want to go check this out. I am adding some sock blanks to my shop. I've wanted to do this for months and months, and I'm finally getting around to doing it. I will say this was my very first time dyeing sock blanks, and I hand painted all of them. So, um, with one exception, <laughs> I'm sorry that I'm like breathing really hard. It's freezing in here and I'm shivering so bad. It's so cold in here. Oh, I'm going to make hot cocoa and get blankets after this. So I have five sock blanks that will be going in the shop this weekend. And unless I decide to keep one for myself. I hand painted all of these and they're abstract, but they are all double knit, which means that it's a double thickness of fabric. So you can knit identical socks two at a time or one at a time but they're designed for two at a time um and that way your socks will be close to identical i'm not going to say they're totally identical because these aren't abstract paintings they're not um like repeating patterns or really symmetrical patterns or anything like that so because of the way double knit sock blanks are with the fabric on top of each other i do my best to make sure that it really saturates both layers but a lot of these have teeny tiny little speckles and dots of color in them which means that sometimes you will get like one layer might have a little bit more of a blue on the speckle and one might have a little bit more of the yellow on the speckle or whatever. So it might not be completely 100% identical, but pretty close. Um, as I mentioned, I am knitting my one at a time Magic Loop socks from a sock blank that I purchased from another indie dyer. Hers are a single knit sock blank, so it's just one layer of fabric, so you don't get identical socks. The, these will not match completely. Um, and I'm totally okay with that. I personally love that. They're also great for shawls and things like that. You don't have to knit socks. But I wanted to get some in my shop that were, it was possible to get nearly matching socks as much as possible. So here we go. These, some of these are going to be discounted a little bit because they were my first time and they came out a little wonky. But here's one of the discounted ones. This is just a fun little random rainbow with a bunch of splashy colors across the back and then I hand painted potion yarns on it. Um, there is a little bit of a mis mistake right here, which is why we're going to discount it. Um, I was playing around with some stencils and some um, hand painting techniques and I didn't realize that some of the finer details were going to get a little bit smudged and I had a little too much water in my dye solutions. So I got a little bit smudgy on a word that I was trying to paint here, but I liked how it kind of just looks like a dash there. And the cool thing is when you knit it up, um, you're not going to see all of these patterns. Of course, you won't see potion yarns or any of the smudges. They're going to look like this little blips of color 
little tiny bits of color. So you're not gonna see a big splotch of black in the middle. You're gonna just see little dots of color. So it's still perfectly good for socks or shawls or sweaters or whatever. I'm just gonna discount it slightly because it was a learning process. So you can get that really pretty rainbow skein or rainbow blank for a bit of a discount. And I've got, uh, this is another one that's gonna be discounted because this was the very first one. And I just felt like it, the black got a little out of control. It got a little splotchy. I wasn't in love, but it's another rainbowy one. It did come out really pretty though. And I think it'll make really nice socks. Um, this one I totally love. This is my steampunk one. So I used some stencils and different stamps and things to get these kind of gear looking images. Plus I just liked that I left more white space on the background of this one. I thought it was really fun. Um, it has a lot of greens and blues in it, so if those are your colors, woohoo. And here's my favorite one. This one really got abstract on me. I love this one. This one I'm trying to resist the urge to keep for myself because I love it so much. Um, I loved the little eye that I painted, and then I really love the speckly random background. It was very random and just crazy, crazy colors, little, you know, random abstract patterns. This one is just so pretty, and so yeah. If I can resist the urge, that'll go in the shop. Um, okay, there's one more sock blank, and this one is extra, extra special. The day that I was painting sock blanks, I had planned to stay home and just paint like normal. And um, it was my day off from the salon, which means working day for yarn. And um, my husband stayed home sick from work that day. He just had a really bad headache and just kind of some achy feelings, and it was cold, and I think he was just fighting a bug. Um, so he decided to stay home and fight it off instead of waiting till he got really sick and missing like three days of work. So he unexpectedly stayed home that day and um, he slept for most of the morning and then got up and about the time that I was painting sock blanks, he came rambling down and um, was just kind of, you know, looking for food and stuff. And I was like trying to cheer him up and I totally didn't think he'd take me up on it, but I was like, do you want to paint a sock blank? Will that make you feel better? And he was like, okay. <laughs> now, um, my husband is an artist. He's a graphic designer. So he, most of his artwork tends to be digital, and um, he did my logo design and my labels and business cards and all of that. He's amazing, uh, but he has a really artistic eye, and he also draws incredibly well. He's amazing at drawing, and so um, it's great being married to another artist. We love that we're both artists, and we can help each other out with our artwork and stuff, but he's never shown any interest in yarn or dyeing. He did try learning to knit one time, um, and he didn't like it and didn't stick with it, but he loves my hand knits, and he loves my yarn dyeing, but he's never tried to do it before. I didn't think he'd take me up on it, and when, I think when I offered, what I had in mind was he would literally come and we'd like paint the sock blank together, and basically I'd tell him what to do, and he'd just like help me apply things. I should have known that wasn't gonna fly. He's an artist, he wants to do his own, right? So I literally just let him do his own. And I was like, what do you wanna do? And this is what he came up with. Not bad, right? Very first time dyeing anything. And he made these colors. Basically, I just helped him with the mixing of the dyes because I know a little bit more what to expect with certain colors and chemicals. But he told me what colors he wanted and then we worked together to mix up some colors and then he completely hand painted this himself. No instruction from me whatsoever. He watched me do one and then he just did this. Um, I love it. I think it's so pretty. I thought he would want to keep it and have me make him a pair of socks or something, but he decided he wanted to offer it to, for sale and I told him it was good enough. I thought he should. So you can get an exclusive Breck Miller Original Care of the Potion Yarns uh, shop. So the, we're, we're thinking about maybe doing a limited edition line of hubby dyed yarns <laughs> but so far this is the only one you can get so that will also be in the shop update and sorry that one's not discounted because it's really good so there you guys go you guys can try knitting from a sock blank thank you guys for being so patient this video turned into kind of a long one i realized that might happen when i start talking about socks because i love them but i'm glad you guys stuck with me for the long haul we will look at more sock knitting techniques and yarns and books and things next week and i hope you guys have a great weekend please check out the shop and see the new things that are coming up there's a lot of really good yummy items in there and i will have new yarn clubs for february coming out in a couple weeks so stay tuned for those but that's where we're going to cast off for today. Love you.